21 News, your place for politics. This is Decision 2024. We are at the six-week sprint to Election Day, and as the presidential candidates are on the trail, we're turning our focus within a week to the vice presidential debate. How will the candidates perform? Could it impact the presidential race? We're also monitoring two big U.S. Senate races in Ohio and Pennsylvania. And of course, we are covering it all. 21 News, your place for politics. And the Decision 2024 21 News political panel is back to go over it all. Joining me this week, we have former publisher of the Buckeye Review, Dr. Mike McNair, former Mercer County Commissioner, Matt McConnell. And to my right, 21 News political analyst and assistant news director, Justin Mitchell. Thank you all for being here. A lot to go over. Let's start with the vice presidential candidates, though, because they're getting ready for their time in the spotlight. Because we are not certain about another presidential debate at this moment, could this debate impact the presidential race? Uh, Matt, I'll start with you. Do you think that this is something where we could hear more about the issues? I think a lot of people actually view this as a proxy. Um, you know, it's not the vice president is oftentimes until it really is necessary is not real important in the in the U.S. political scene, um, but how they they display will, will obviously relate some of what the actual principles will be. So I think I think it could, and this is such a tight race that this absolutely could affect it one way or the other. Is there a certain issue that you'll be watching for? I'm gonna I'm gonna be looking at what is most important to them. As I say, uh, from my perspective, I think one of the things that divide the candidates are international uh, politics, insecurity here domestically and abroad. Okay, and Mike, on this debate night coming up, what will you be looking for between the two candidates? We've had a lot happen on the trail involving the vice presidential candidates. Yeah, so uh, unfortunately for our Ohio Senator J.D. Vance, he's going to be on the hook for the cat lady and the Springfield lies about patients eating cats. And, uh, and I'm, I'm afraid that that's going to take up more than it should. But what I'm looking for really is more policy debate. And I expect that they will demand that he answer more about Project 2025, because when President Trump speaks, he's not very easy to nail down on policy because he doesn't have policy. But J.D. Vance can be a lot more articulate uh, as opposed to being what was used to be in the Republican Party, compassionate conservatism. Some have called him more com combative conservatism. So he's going to be very clear, but I think they'll be able to nail him down and have him answer some real hard questions about Project 2025. And their personalities are different from the presidential candidates. Both of them kind of have their own repertoire and way of handling the issues when they're you know, talking to voters and also talking to the media. Wondering, are there any moments that you're going to be watching for, Justin, that could make the news the next day that might be the big moments that could shape this race? Right. This one's going to be a little bit of a different dynamic than previous vice presidential debate. Historically, vice presidential debates were the moments where you sent out your attack dogs while you maintained your composure at the top of the ticket. Well, we're several election cycles away from that being the way that this is done anymore. There's <laughs> plenty of punching at the top of the ticket. Um, but you've got different standards, I think, that people are looking for in both of these candidates. I think Walls is going to probably be sort of the attack dog. That's sort of been the role he's been playing on the stump. He's got zingers. He makes that face when he says things. He delivers lines. Vance, though, remember, is really... He, he's chosen by Donald Trump to be sort of the heir apparent because Donald Trump is 78 years old and has a tendency to wander off topic. I mean, people do have concerns about his age and acuity. So they're looking for Vance to be a standard bearer for a party, whereas they are looking to Walls to land a few kind of zinger lines. And so the standards are going to be really, really different. And I, it depends on what eyes you're watching it through. But if you're watching it through the eyes of an undecided voter, you're probably looking to see if Vance looks like a serious leader or does he look like he's going to do the bidding of Donald Trump? Because you've obviously already made up your mind about Donald Trump and you're either in or you're out. If you're on the bubble, you're going, 
are there serious people around him? And that's the biggest thing I think people are going to be looking for. Matt, do you agree? Because no, I, I actually don't. I Lindsay. didn't think so. I, I think the age issue was more of a Biden thing, but Absolutely. Trump is now I, the older candidate in the race. And I'd have to say it was probably combative compassionism versus conservatism, okay. because <laughs> Trump actually down deep is a compassionate person. He is probably the one of the worst communicators of what his real intentions are. I wish he had just a tad bit of Reagan in him. Um, but, you know, it, it, sometimes you have to look by his randomness um, and some of the things that he says. Um, and I know that, you know, some of the analysts out there are saying he's a much more mature politician this time, and he knows how D.C. works. The last time he'd been to D.C., I think 12 or 14 times in his lifetime, um, he thought he was going to make a difference and a change because he was friends with Pelosi and, and, and Schumer because he was a campaign contributor of theirs. Once you get into that race, all of a sudden it becomes combative, and, and he, he battled under false pretenses for the first two years of his first uh, term, and then COVID hit him in the, in the fourth. So it is one where, you know, I see his randomness sometimes being that he's thinking ahead and not actually going through with, with some of that. He has a lot of policies. We've heard more policies from Trump than we have from, from the Kamala uh, process all together. What? what? You've heard policies? Okay. I'm, I'd be interested to hear some of those. <laughs> and I think there is something happening in Pittsburgh this week where Kamala is supposed to unveil more information on her economic vision for the country. But Justin, when we look at the news coverage of the mm -hmm. issues and the specifics, she's currently in office. So there could be two sides to that coin. Sure. Where she is on the issues, she's currently in office. Also, people want to hear more details on how she'd serve. How do you cover that in the media? And how do you, as a reporter, and, and you know, you're sending reporters out within your role, get to the root of some of those questions for undecided voters, though there is a small sliver, maybe? Right. Well, that's what's really tough. I think that what you just said, that small sliver and getting at what exactly it is that they're looking for is the key to what questions you need to ask and what you're looking for. You know, there were, un there were undecided voters in 2016 that tipped the election for Donald Trump. And... Presumably, their thought process at the time was that they were not happy with the status quo and they may not have liked the rhetoric. It's hard to say what, you know, a lot of them have said they didn't like the rhetoric, but they wanted a change and they were willing to sort of eh, throw a wrench in the system. Same way there was a Bernie wave that year in the primaries. They were looking for something different. Well, they don't really have a something different candidate this time. They have a former president and a sitting vice president. So what is it that those undecideds are looking for? And, uh, you know, you hear them talk a lot about the economy. Okay, but that's also a complicated issue because you have a former president and you have a vice president who doesn't have, a vice president is one of the least consequential positions mm -hmm. in the United States government. And she's got to thread a needle where she's not going to come out and say, this is the, these are the Biden policies that I don't like and I'll change. But she needs to convince people that she's not more of the same. So all, I, I know this is a long answer for what to get it with the undecideds, but it's tough to say where their heads are because these are such polarized times that there's so few of them. And the voters at the end of the day obviously making the decision. So if they don't get enough information from either candidate or what they're looking for, who knows how they'll weigh in. But I did moderate the debate with Vance and Tim Ryan, along with some of my other colleagues. And he is quick when it comes to the issues. If there's a question, he will turn it to some of the current issues that they're stumping for, more so than other candidates were able to do. He was, you know, very new at that and was quick. So performance-wise, even though he's a freshman sure. senator, we might see some fireworks. And I, I agree. It's one, I was, I was confused when, when Trump picked Vance um, and wasn't sure about that until I got to know Vance uh, much better. Uh, and researched him, um, and he's a very intellectual, intelligent individual that that has been through a lot. Everybody can read his book, see the movie. Right. Uh, it's been a strange way to the to DC for him, um, but he also has shown his integrity uh, through his military service uh, and his leadership there. So it is going to be an interesting comparison. Yeah, both personalities are big. Yeah, I, th I think. Uh he lacks integrity when he lambasts another service member for his military service. Anybody that's serving the military knows, look, this is a sacrificial job that you do. You put your life on the line for the country to do whatever it says. So to throw rocks at each other, you know, where Walsh was uh, served 26 years or 28 years and he served four years, all of it's good. 
but to try to turn around and say, you know, his service wasn't good and start denigrating. I understand politics. You want to try to make your other person um, down a peg, but it's real unfortunate. And that's why I think um, Vance lacks integrity. He's intelligent, but he lacks integrity. He's fast. So he can change from being calling Trump a Hitler to now being his number number one attack dog, you know, for him. But uh, uh, I think uh, he he lacks integrity. Although he's intelligent, he'll be fast, but he'll be clear that uh, he doesn't have the compassion that you say Trump has. I don't think Trump has compassion either, except for himself. There's obviously a difference of opinion here on the panel. It'll be something to watch. Let's move <laughs> on now to the race for U.S. Senate. Who controls the Senate? Uh, could tip in the Republicans' favor. We're looking at some mixed reports right now in the news. NBC News reporting the high-stakes Montana race is leaning Republican right now, and that has been one of the ground zeros for them. We're also covering two battleground races in Ohio and Pennsylvania. So we're looking at the Senate. Obviously, how they vote, the House votes, really impacts the presidential race and whoever wins. Uh, but I want to look at Ohio first. Democratic incumbent Sherrod Brown facing off against Bernie Marino. Uh, and in Pennsylvania, we've got Democratic candidate Senator Bob Casey defending his seat against Republican candidate Dave McCormick. So those are the two breakdowns. But in Ohio, we don't have a ton of polling data to look at this race right now. Just three polls that were out, one from late July through early September, the, the newest one showing Brown, and they're all consistent. He's up two points. So this is a tight race. Uh, and I think that... We're not sure if they're going to debate so far, nothing on the schedule, but which candidate appears to have the edge in your view, knowing what you know about Ohio politics, both of you, go ahead and weigh in because I'd like to see where you think their strengths and weaknesses are. Well, I, th I think uh, obviously Brown has the edge because he's the incumbent and he people know him. He's a blue collar dude, you know, rough, scruffy, but he he's fights for, he has, he has uh, endorsements from sheriffs, uh, he's fought for pensions that people received that that uh, that the GOP was trying to ratchet away, but that's kind of the way they are. Um, so he is in the fight for his life because for it to still be so close and because, you know, um, Ohio has gone red so consistently, uh, that makes it the fight of his life. And I understand that there's going to be some crypto money going, coming into Marino's campaign very soon, which may tip the balance. I'm afraid for that, to be honest, because I think... Uh, Brown Brown does have the edge, but this ne these next six weeks is going to make some big difference. Well, the political science experts have said this is going to be one of the most expensive, if not the most expensive, Senate race. When you look at what's happening, obviously, you're in Pennsylvania, so we'll talk about what you're seeing on the ground. But over here, from a, a view from a distance, what do you think's working for the candidates or not? Well, I think one is people are always going to look, do I need a change, right? And, and I think there's a certain aspect this year that says, yeah, we want to change. We don't like what is going on, what we're seeing in D.C. I think what has happened as well, and, and you've seen it over the last several elections, Mahoning, Trumbull, uh, Mercer, Lawrence, Crawford County, uh, your viewing area has been an area that really wasn't represented extremely well in D.C. for what is important to us, right? And I think that's where even the Teamsters polling came out, 60 percent for Trump, 33 percent, I think, for for uh, Harris. Um, I think what is happening right now is all of a sudden the, the Republicans are the working party all of a sudden. And it's a strange switch. It really, it really has been a, a strange switch. Um, and, and, you know, so it's going to be an interesting um, deal. And, and I do believe that, you know, as commissioner for 12 years in Mercer County, I saw our candidate who has been sitting in D.C. Uh, for a long time only come at election time and only give appearances. Okay, that doesn't, that doesn't go well in, in our area. And I don't think it goes well over here either because I believe the attitude is the same. You know, give us, give us the opportunity and we'll prove what we can do. We're not asking for handouts. We're asking to make you basically for a, a little playing field out of D.C. We, we spent a lot of money from, from the Rust Belt, that used to be the Industrial Belt down south, uh, now our representation in D.C. needs to make sure that we're represented here um, and that we make sure that basically we're still paying all those tax dollars I'm and glad not you, getting them back. You're right. And you, I will agree with you that as, as it's interesting that the Teamsters seem to be leaning um, in, the, in the side of uh, the Trump side, but all the other unions 
seem to f fall on the side of the Democrats. And you can see that uh, President Biden walked the picket line. Now, Trump, you know, gives rhetoric, but Biden, you know, was put his whole credibility on the line to say, I support working people. And as, as Vice President Harris says, we thank the unions, period, because unions are the foundation of the working class. Everybody else gets better services, even if you're not in the union, because of the unions. Whereas the Republicans are good for firing unions, getting rid of unions. Ow. Oh, well, I'm just saying, you know, <laughs> Reagan's famous, right? They have traffic controllers. And so uh, while, while it's nice to say that they're, you know, for the working person, the truth is, if you're for health care, you don't want to take away health care. If you're for women, you want to take it away. And that's what, that's what we see a lot uh, coming from the Republicans. So, But we have two candidates, one with a voting record and one without one at all. Mm -hmm. And right now, Sherrod's defending his voting record majority of the time with Biden. So if the voters are not on board with all of those policies, they may say, well, who else do we have? But I'm wondering because it's also about the campaign. Mm -hmm. and. We're in a weird situation right now in Ohio in timing. We don't have a debate confirmed between the two. We saw one in the last race. We saw two, actually. Mm. We hosted the second one. <laughs> but we've got a situation where we're looking at just ad after ad. We're not seeing big sit-down interviews on the issues. And we haven't seen a ton of Bernie on the trail, just when you look at comparison on how many stops since you know Labor Day, maybe a little bit more. but. Brown campaign very early. You can't turn on one streaming service without right. seeing his ads. But that's not necessarily, uh, th that's potentially the sign of somebody who's worried. I mean, Brown was spending money much earlier than an incumbent ought to be needing to spend money, particularly going up against a pretty novice candidate. Mm -hmm. And Bernie Marino's got baggage. He's not the strongest candidate in the world. And yet, you pointed out that 2% average, that two-point average, right. mm -hmm. and it was five. So it's tightening. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Brown... Brown has the edge if he doesn't squander it. And here's where, you know, I, I call it the Tim Ryan mistake, which was, and, and we saw this in the, the race against J.D. Vance. Tim Ryan knew he needed to reach moderates, but he overreached to moderates and he alienated Democrats because he got, he bought into this idea that there were no Democrats in Ohio. Remember the turnout in Cuyahoga County was just not there. Places like that didn't turn out for Ryan. So what Brown needs to be careful of and needs to be cognizant of if he wants to maintain the edge is that he was able to win Ohio by sizable margins in the Trump era. So there are these mythical voters who vote for Donald Trump and Sherrod Brown. And if he did nothing, he might have been able to hold them, and he does risk alienating his own base. Mm -hmm. Now, in the PA race, it's a little bit more interesting because of how the top of the ticket's going to affect things. And I don't mean necessarily Harris or Biden and Casey, but it's that McCormick you know, you may recall, did not get the Trump endorsement the last time he ran, and it ended up going to Mehmet Oz. And that was largely reported to be because McCormick was not willing to go out and repeat a lie about a stolen election in 2020. And so Trump and him did not really get along, and Trump has not said much about him at all, if anything. You might know if he said anything so far in that race. So if PA Trump voters see McCormick as other, you could have a reverse split where they're voting for Trump at the top, but maybe staying home. They're not voting for Casey. Trump voters in PA are not voting for Casey, but they might skip McCormick. Trump, Trump has actually, uh, I'm not sure if it's a full force endorsement of McCormick, but absolutely has, has embraced him. Sure. Um, sort of like the JD, the JD Vance. Now McCormick has come out, as, as you indicated, he doesn't agree on Trump with, with all things. Um, McCormick is one of those really great candidates. If you could try to draw one out on a whiteboard, you might come up with Dave McCormick. Uh, very well educated, very bright, uh, West Point, um, active duty in, in combat zone, uh, served at the White House as, a, I think, an undersecretary of commerce, um, met his wife there, who was, I think, an undersecretary of international or, or, or Department of State. Um, she actually, they, I think they have seven girls. Um, so a lot of what you hear about Dave McCormick, um, uh, super bright, super successful. If you're going to hold wealth and, and success against somebody, that's his negative, which I 
don't understand. Um, he's, he's been extremely successful. He's a sixth generation Pennsylvanian. Had he moved into or had houses in other locations as he has had employment elsewhere, much like a lot of our, our residents had to do is find jobs elsewhere, but their real home is right here. And Matt, on this topic, so I looked at real clear polling's data on this race, mm -hmm. and right now Casey's in a slightly stronger position and about 4.5 points over McCormick. Is there any issue that seems to help him over his opponent? Casey seems to have the lead. Is there anywhere where some of that ground could be C made up? Casey has a name in, in Pennsylvania that goes okay. back to his dad. Um, and if he's riding coattails, it's, it's basically that. As a 12-year commissioner, I got to meet both of them. I got to meet whenever Dave McCormick lost in the primary. Um, and he made it to Mercer County and talked about substantive issues. Um, Casey, when he came, he only came during election years, typically, um, and he really didn't discuss any any issues. It was more leaning right to his party and and doing a campaign type type event that upsets local local folks, right? Um, Donald Trump, whenever he became president, invited the commissioners, Republican and Democrat, down to D.C. to the executive office building from all the states because he wanted everybody at, at the ground level, at, at the grassroots level, to have contacts where you needed them, whether it was Department of State, whether it was energy, depending on where it was. Um, that was something that whenever he called, most of the people hung up the phone. Hmm. They, they thought they were being hacked. Our actually, our, our, the head of our County Commissioners Association in Pennsylvania called all the counties and said, please take the call. You keep <laughs> hanging up on the White House. Oh no, um, awkward. And, and I said, you know, I said, then they, they took questions from both sides, and, and they wanted to hear that. Uh, and, and so, you know, as dirty and as, as gruff and as nasty as it gets, they really like to take all the parts and, and, and get into that. Um, McCormick came to our town, got to know some of the things there, talked about people he had gone to West Point with that, that were serving in our, in our courthouse. Um, those were things that were, you know, he touches and, and is there. Um, and so it's going to be an interesting race. Um, Pennsylvania has closed the gap. Um, that's one thing that a lot of folks haven't been looking at is the registered Democrats versus the registered Republicans. And, and I think it's a 350,000 switch. Um, and so what used to be close races are going to be much, much more close. Yeah, and that has um, made the national news, but I did not hear that about Pennsylvania. I, I'm curious about that when you say that about them closing the gap, because the way you describe McCormick sounds very much like you're describing a Republican of 10, 15 years ago. Now, in the Trump era, there are Republicans who were Republicans then, too, and they're on board, but there are also, we know, nationally and in Ohio, and I imagine in PA also, Republicans who really found the Trump era distasteful and say they wanted a return to that type of, you know, sort of buttoned down business Republican, which is how McCormick sounds to be. So I'm curious if you have any insight into which type of Republican these new Republicans in PA are. <laughs> I, I think they look at the uh, at both and, and find out who's going to act. And I think one of the things, whenever you look at it, I think act, from an economic standpoint, both candidates at, at the top level are spend. I think the, some, certain Republicans are saying I, I, we need a watchdog um, to, to, to pull that in and figure out how you're going to spend that money if both of them are tax and spend or yeah. just spend. Um, we don't need any more taxation. We don't need any more debt. Um, so then the next question becomes is more that security, and I think that's a big difference, whether it be international or domestic. Um, and that's where Casey is, is going to have to uh, face voters in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. Um, there's a section of, of Philadelphia um, that with our opioid money that we had as, as a settlement, um, I went ahead and looked and said, you know, here's a town of like 45,000 or a section of Philadelphia, 45,000 people that are getting a significant amount. And then I saw photos of it and it's like, yeah, spend the money there. Mm. Uh, spend the money there because that is where everybody from, I think, Philadelphia, everybody from Pennsylvania, New Jersey, they come in and, and it is, it looks like a war zone and it looks like somebody has given up. Um, and with it being a sanctuary city, um, it is one, is there the influence of, of the drugs coming in other ways. So it, it is one that Casey's gonna have to answer to the voters for that. And I think the folks in the cities, cause it used to be, um, and I just had this debate yesterday with somebody, it used to be you had a T. Everybody called it the T and they told the Democrat candidates, just 
campaign in Philadelphia, Pittsburgh. Don't worry about the rest of the rural areas. We might get you up to Wilkes-Barre, Scranton, or Erie, but all the Democrats will fall in line with you. In Mercer County, 30% of the voters have switched from being Democrats to, to Republican. We have gone from whenever I ran a negative 7,000 to a positive 12,000 Republicans today. Um, and now, we can't take that for granted if, if, if I'm saying I'm a Republican, um, because those are middle of the ground voters that are gonna vote on, on practical items and say, what are you doing for yeah. Mercer County? And as I say, yeah. we want the opportunity. We want the, and, and it's no different here. We want the opportunity be, because we'll work harder and outwork anybody um, in the country. I, I truly believe we still have that workforce and that mentality here. I think the voters are hungry. Everyone wants more information. They wanna have a say. We do have big issues on the table. I want to round out with some of the big headlines, though, before we go. So one of the things that we know Democrats are tackling, and they're going to have to garner votes on the economy. That's a big issue. A lot of voters concern. The majority of voters say that's their top issue. Their message, I'm sure folks are going to be paying attention to that. On the GOP side, there's also some blunders, though. While they are running ahead maybe in that issue, they're having some issues with the female vote in the news. And we have two instances on the trail that could be consider considered blunders, Vance and the cat lady comment, depending on how you take the comment. Uh, Marino and the suburban woman on the issue of abortion. He said it was tongue in cheek. Others don't agree. <clears throat> when you look at the dynamics of what was said, how it's said, and the messaging, wondering if you think that that's going to be a problem for the GOP at the end of the day at the ballot box and how much of a, a portion of the voters, the female voters, are going to decide this election? Well, there are more women voters than men. And I think those blunders are not so uh, inadvertent because they're speaking what they really feel. So for Marino to say, oh, women over 50 don't care about abortion and kind of laugh it off. Well, guess what? Everybody cares about abortion, right? Children are being raped. Women are bleeding out in parking lots. And I think the women vote is going to sweep the country as well as Ohio, Pennsylvania, even if it's not on the ballot. We saw it on our ballot last year when you know we had to change the constitution in order to support that. But we also hear from the feds, from the, at the federal level, that they want to, you know, they want to outlaw it at the federal level since they, you know, got rid of Dobbs. And uh, I think women are paying attention, right? So it's not the cat lady thing. I think it's more just women in particular. And I think women are sensitive to it, to be honest. I don't think they're stupid. And what do you think, Matt? Because, uh, you know, folks are going to take the comments. They're going to digest them their way. Would you advise the candidates to be talking in this way? No. Okay. No, obviously not. And, and but... I, I once said, and, and I have said it multiple times, I would volunteer for free if Trump would only allow me to uh, edit his, his speeches. <laughs> he won't allow anybody to edit his speeches. Even if he writes his own speech, he's going to go ahead and go off script oh, and say something. He's notorious for blunders. Uh, does that mean that that's his, his true nature? I don't think it is. And I don't think it's just a litmus test for, for females either. There's as many females that, that understand the sanctity of life uh, but understand that there are, are items there. Um, and like in the McCormick race, that has become an issue. Mm -hmm. um, and McCormick has openly said in, in his discussions that there are exceptions. Um, he said, I've got seven girls and a, and a wife um, that, that go ahead and, and talk through the points. Um, but there has to be a point somewhere, right? And I, I understand in, in talking to a lot of females, uh, I'll ask that question. Um, you know, and it's not a clear cut. You know, there somewhere in in between is is the blur line, um, and it can't be just free genocide um, on any any children. Um, but it also should not be uh, it should not be you know it, it should not be just a, a, a non issue that hey this this is it. There are are the health of the woman is is definitely there. I think a lot of the females are also looking at hey my kids are gonna probably have to go off to war in one circumstance and not the other. And I've, I've, I've been hearing that um, is, hey, you know what, what, what are the likelihoods of Ukraine going out of control or Israel or others? And I think, I think we've been very weak over the last three and a half years on, on the foreign uh, security issues. I don't, um, I don't, I don't know that, the, that Trump's history would prove that he might be better than what's going on well, right now. We're dealing now. with a different set of scenarios than we were you, back then. 
But back and part to- of it is because I think sometime some of it was diverted because of the actions of what Trump did. Okay. And it, it was much like Reagan uh, when Lockerbie went down, missiles went into to Libya. And everybody thought Reagan was the next World War III. That was what we were warned about during the election. It ended up because he was stern and, and principled. Everybody knew where that red line was and didn't cross it. When my understanding is when the towers got got bombed in the in the parking garage before the air, airplanes, this was before it, the first call was from Libya that said, we had nothing to do with it. Please do not send in any missiles. Mm-hmm. We will help you, right? Mm-hmm. And so you have to have a certain amount of strength. And that is something that I think the candidates, rightly so or not, a, a mm-hmm. vice president really doesn't have that ability to, to do it, but she's not coming across extremely strong either. She's coming across as a prosecutor out of San Francisco and then, and then attorney general of, of California. Well, with, I think if you have the record though, right, so you, we've already decided that vice president is more ceremonial and it kind of goes along with the program. But you have four years of Trump, four years of Biden. You make those two comparison internationally, economically, health-wise, for women, everything, you have, you have a decision. Now, what will uh, Harris do? Will it be very different? What will Trump do? Will it be very different? Well, we know tr- what Trump will do because all of the dictators want him in, right? So we know what the world will look like. We know what NATO sure will look like. I'm not sure they do. Oh, oh they have said, sure and, he's, and he's bragged about who sent him. Why, why did they give the information to the uh, Harris campaign from, from Trump's? Why did Iran go ahead and, and steal that well, and deliver it? The, the, the question really is, you know, that uh, Trump is, can, can hardly be trusted with secret information because as soon as it's in, it's out in the, in the ether like, oh, it's nothing. It's not, I don't, and I'm not talking about the secret documents in his bathroom at Mar-a-Lago that he was charged for, but even more than that, he oh. probably couldn't have <laughs> We're going to button this up, but yeah, I, I do see a lot, of, a lot of the issues are spilling over into the state races, the turnout. We'll see how it all pans out. We already had the abortion rights bill in Ohio last time around in the, prime, or in the uh, midterm, so we'll see or you know the state ballot issue if that still is alive with the energy or if you think maybe not you know with the co- I, I think the energy is still alive right. with the comments from Vance and Marino both of them and more than more than policy and what they really meant because I don't know if they meant them as a joke or not I think that Vance might have meant it a little more than Marino because he's written similar things several other times mm-hmm. the bottom line is let's say they were both jokes you ever watch a comedian that's not funny and hate them really quickly yeah. If, or you you're, just if a politician's not funny, they should not make edgy jokes. And whether you like them or hate them, J.D. Vance is not funny. Bernie Marino is not funny. Donald Trump is hilarious. And that is sometimes the deciding factor as to how much you can get away with what you've said. All right. Well, I, don't think, I don't think enough people realize that Donald Trump is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's well, an entertainer, you know, that's We've been that's watching for years. We're going to watch all the way through November at least. I really appreciate you joining us right here in our decision 2024 set here our brand new panel scene it's looking pretty well, good and i i appreciate you guys doing this because yes. it help it will help the voters i think yeah. and um it's a lot of, lot to consider and like we said we don't get to flesh it out as much in the news because we're out of time and we have to keep things tight and move on so i really appreciate you being here thank I you so and much. i wish all candidates came on and gave interviews right yeah well hopefully we see them all and maybe we'll see some debates we don't know yet Anyone's guess. All right. Well, thank you for being here. If you want to watch more of our political panels, just head over to the WFMJ YouTube page, also on the 21 News app and WFMJ.com.